I'm so grateful you you allowed me onto your stage. And I think it's season two, episode one. It is now. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> so I, I went loud. You may have to modulate the voices and audio. We shall begin in a few seconds. I'm always a little nervous before I start recording. I feel that. I feel a little bit of a... Um, it seems I, like there's a little wall. What's What are you feeling? Because I haven't recorded an episode in six months. Okay. I haven't recorded in six months. So I, I finished season one um, in December. Okay. And I took a little break to kind of regroup and to find more inspiration and to find time to book time. And then today is the day that I start recording again. And I'm like, okay, do I remember how to do this? Like, is it like muscle memory? <laughs> like, do I get back on the horse and then, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. It felt like you were anxious and excited and yeah. nervous. Yeah. And a lot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, let's just, you know what, let's just get going. Um, right now... Um, hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of the Alpha Female Chronicles podcast. My name is Lindsay. I am the author and creator of the podcast. I am also the author of the Alpha Female Chronicles poetry collection that you can purchase from the Friesen Press website. Today, I have the honor of having as a guest Alex from Toronto Dance Salsa. Hi, Alex. Hey, beautiful. Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday. Happy Friday. So I would like you to take some time to tell the people about who you are and what Toronto Dance Salsa is all about. Yes. So my name is Alex. I run Canada's largest salsa dance school called Toronto Dance Salsa. My mission is that every human being feels like they belong on every part of the planet, like every human being. And so the way I'm going to be approaching that and the way I've been doing that and building that is through dance, putting together dance and mental wellness. So it's the only class in the world where it's like we do 55 minutes of salsa, bachata. And at the end of the class, we do a giant huddle. 40, 50 people, doctors, lawyers, and whatnot from all different backgrounds, all ages, all genders. And I share for two or three minutes a personal moment in my life where I was struggling with something, but something I learned from it. And it is my way of when students come in to not only feel like, they, like they're like incredible dancers, even though they think they have two left feet, but also when they leave, to leave with a little bit more self-reflection and understanding. And at a minimum, when I share those stories, they all feel like they're not the only ones that are going through the things that I'm going through. And I believe that when we spend time around people who are authentic and honest, it gives us permission to look within ourselves because we feel safe enough. Definitely. That's a beautiful mission. Um, and as someone who has attended a free session of your class, I can definitely say I feel with every dance and in your approach, how important it is for you to have people feel like they belong and feel that no matter what background they have or whatever dance skills they have, that they do fit into the group. I mean, they might be like I was um, around a bunch of strangers and, you know, I was dancing in my living room, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah. there's this sense of come as you are. And it doesn't matter if you miss a few steps or if you're not dancing on the beat, as long as you're having fun, that you're smiling, that's all that matters. So that's something that I, I thought that was so endearing. And also your energy, I have to say, Alex, your, your energy <laughs> is contagious. It is your dynamic and your passion for dance and for people you're able to translate it well in the way you communicate with others. And I think that's what makes people so interested in your dance class. 
So tell me how how did it start? How did this journey start? First of all, I don't know if you noticed as you were complimenting me, I crossed my arms and started rubbing myself because and I caught it because I'm still on this self-love journey to even believe the beautiful things you're saying. But I know at least I'm capable of receiving 30% of the love and admiration. So thank you for that. I, I just want to recognize you, you queen. And also for me, I mean, like my whole life, I didn't feel like I belong. Like I remember I was 13 years old and I'm walking outside my school. It was uh, lunchtime. And I'm walking by myself on this thin little path and kids are playing. And I looked up and I had this thought. I, I thought, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. And I, I actually imagined myself like 93 and I'm by myself. And I remember I started crying, crying because I believed it. And, and like so deeply engraved. And so from, from a for, since little, I've always felt like the odd one out in my family, with my friends, everywhere. I did not feel like I belonged. And that reflected a lot in all the different professions. So now running a dance school, which was, you know, I wanted to be a marriage counselor originally. So when I was 17, <laughs> I went into psychology to be a marriage counselor. And then two years into it, I switched training to be a cop. Then I switched and pivoted again and got into sales, which just like, cause I, I didn't know what to do. And then it was this dance school. The thing that was always consistent was I always wanted a place where I belong. I always wanted to serve people. I always had this gut instinct that when I see someone else who doesn't feel like they belong, who feels like, who looks like they're left out, like I'm super hypersensitive. If I'm at a party, I'll, I'll always notice the people who are quiet or who are removed or who in some way feel like they don't belong. And I can't help but run towards them like it's a fire because I know what it's like. And I got this tattoo where it says belong on my wrist. It's the only tattoo. And I never even believed in tattoos because it's the mountain that I can't conquer as in the sense of like saying, well, I love myself enough. Like that. It doesn't make sense. You just go to the next level of love. You go to the next level of belonging, but it's eternal, which I think is beautiful because I, you know, if I imagine if I ever reach that mountain, I'd want to go somewhere else. Like I don't actually want to reach it because you don't want to camp out there for the rest of your life. So it, it, it came from personal pain and it just really comes down to one thing. Purpose comes from pain. It doesn't mean living in pain, but it means the hunger always comes from something difficult in the past. And you can use that hunger to build something beautiful or at the same time. And I've had many moments in my life where I've um, spiraled down because of it. The, the pity party, the shame party, all that. I've had both. And it's me just learning to live in the flame, in that light more often. Wow. That is really beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. Um, many people can relate to that. That feeling that, especially as a child, some, sometimes you do feel like you're so different from others. You're not blending in. But at a young age, we don't understand that we were not born to blend. We're born to, to shine. You know, we're born to be a light. But we're so concerned about fitting in that we'd rather blend in. And when we can't blend in because there is something inside of us, a flame that just asks just to shine bright we're trying to kind of suppress it because we just want to blend in you know we don't want to stick out and that feeling of deep down inside you kind of feel like well I don't fit in I don't belong here like I might be alone for the rest of my life so many people can relate to that and it's so difficult at a young age to really pinpoint, okay, why do I feel like that? What's causing me? What's triggering me? Because as a child, you don't think like that. You don't think about words like trigger and causes and solutions and treatments. You don't think about that. You just think, okay, this is what I see around me. I'm in the playground. There are cliques forming and um, kids together playing, but I feel so different from them. I feel like I don't even have the right to try to be friends with them, try to uh, hang out with them because on the inside, I believe this lie that I am so different, therefore I cannot belong to another group or, or I can't fit in with other people. 
And this is why I, I really love the concept of your of Toronto Dance Salsa because I, and I read on the website it was written more than a dance class. It is more than a dance dance class, you know. Um, I think it's your mission statement that this is a place to be you. You're braver than you think. You're stronger than you know. You're sexier than you yeah, realize. Than realize. Yeah. <laughs> you know, unleash your potential. Find your happy place. Just show up. Just dance. And I think it's so, it's very encouraging. And it's something that I think we, we have to face every day of our lives. The same way that, you know, you have the long tattooed on your arm. It's a constant reminder for you to remember maybe your def definition of what belong means. So when you think of belong, what are the words that come to mind? I, I mean, that's a great question. Um, so I define belong in three ways. Open arms, seek to understand, and honest validation. And the way I can paint it is whether it's through the virtual classes, right, that you were part of. So Monday nights, I do them for free. Or when students walked in through the door, like, I'd be waiting by the door and when students would come in or virtually when people pop up, I'd hug them, I'd high five them, I'd welcome them just as they arrive because it's so important. Like imagine, you know, you come home and your partner's already at home, for example, and you say, hey, honey. And they're like, rr, rr. Yeah. like in that little exchange of there's a micro rejection there and it's not your fault and it's not on purpose or anybody, but like, so I know the power of open energy. And so it definitely, if everybody was just more open, it's easier. And yet I realize it's not enough. The seeking to understand is something I was always hungry for. And you think so, so you said so correctly, but you said fitting in. So fitting in is literally the opposite of belonging. It's not not belonging. It's fitting in is asking yourself to be someone you're not in order to get the love that you want. And so like it's trials and tribulations for me, but I was always hungry for just, can you love me for my heart, even if you don't agree with how I do things? And I think that's such an important thing that to see everybody's inner diamond, right? Like even if you're not living your life like that, can you look past the actions and look at the heart, look at the why? And I think that if more people look inside each other for the why, why, what drives them, not what they do, Life would be better. And the last is honest validation because I always wanted to be seen. Not just like, you know, good job. So like one of the things I literally worked on, it was a muscle, was I'd walk around, there'd be like 40, 50 people here. And uh, one by one, I'd have like 20, 30 seconds because the song is four minutes. I have 20, 30 seconds to help them where they're struggling, to make them feel like they belong and to have them smiling and laughing. And so one of my go-to things has always been that if I recognize, I never say good job. I never say, you know, I'm proud of you. I'll say, hey, I remember you last week. You were struggling here a little bit. And look at you shining in the spot right here. I'm so proud of you. Like just the, just the idea of being actually seen is so powerful. And I believe that if everybody is welcomed with open arms, if everybody is understood authentically for who they are and validated, there'd be no war. There'd be no struggles. But those are three ways I define belong. Wow. I mean, this is a great way to really, um, I guess, pinpoint what it really means to belong. And I love the, um, the distinction you make um, between belonging and fitting in, because it is true when as an adult, especially like in a professional environment, whether you're um, at a workplace or with colleagues, you are looking for ways to fit in. You know, you're trying to fit in with the culture of your job or try to fit in with your colleagues. You know, you try to have things in common, but there's always, and I'll, I'll speak from my experience, um, there's always this feeling that I'm like, I feel like I have to not put on an act, but kind of dilute myself a little bit just so I can kind of get along or fit in with these people rather than just coming as myself in every space and just see who will stick around with me being just me, you know? And yeah. um, there's this desire when you want to belong somewhere to have a safe space, 
you know, to be in a safe space. And that's not something that's easy to do, especially when you're struggling to always feel like maybe there's something missing in you or something something is wrong with you, but the desire to, to find a safe space. And I do believe that your dance class provides a safe space for the students to be themselves, to enjoy, to learn as well. And it must be difficult for newcomers to, first of all, just join a dance class, you know, and I think there might be a lot of people who maybe identify as, as more introverted, introverted or shy who come to your class, you know, um, what, what does it take really to get into the groove when we join your class? What does it take? It just, um, I hope this is going to answer it in exactly the same way, because uh, funny enough, I'd say about 60% to 70% of our students are introverted, not extroverted, like majority are introverted. Um, I, I think if we look at the core of why, uh, you know, whether you're introverted or extroverted, we all want to belong. And so when I think of introversion, and extroversion, so I'm definitely on the extroverted side. But majority of the instructors I've trained, majority of my students are introverted. And what I believe about it is introversion, all it means is to be able to refill your cup, you need some alone time. But at the same time, you look at, um, you know, you look at some of the world, so I love comedians, like, like whether it's Kevin Hart or classic like George Carlin. But if you look at the speakers, very, and it's going to come back to the students, I know I'm a little bit riffing off, but. When you look at all these incredible speakers, some are introverts, some are extroverted, just like actors. And so the, 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 the stage, I believe, is for everybody. Why I think that introverted people actually get pulled in here more and then how they can manage that is my next answer will be. But what pulls them in is that, they're, that everyone wants a community. And for people who are introverted, sometimes it's harder to just go up to a random person. It's just harder to be like, hey, do you want to be my friend? Like, it's a muscle. It's, 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 it's a muscle. And to be honest, it's hard for me to do that as well. Like, like if I have a buddy with me, I can go up to talk to any stranger, no problem. But if I'm by myself, I am so awkward and people never believe that they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, no. Cause I am just as sensitive to rejection and not being loved. In fact, I have ADHD. My brain is hypersensitive to that stuff. Like there are so many superpowers to it, but one of them is I'm extremely sensitive to rejection slightest. And so for the reason why introverted people get pulled in here is because it's an easy hack to meet positive people. Because one of the things about it is dance. You can't help but be pop. Like when you hear music, like you can't help but feel good and smile. And so that gets you out of your head. And I think that's one of the most important things for especially introverted people. It's for me as well. I noticed in my life that that self-talk can spiral so quickly down. But what dance does in a positive way is it forces you to get out of your head, to get out of your pain, and for a moment, be with another human being and connect. And when that happens, it's better than antidepressants. Not that I'm saying I'm a doctor or anything, but it's the most natural way to feel safe, make connections, be part of a community while all just having fun. Mm -hmm. It's like a hack. It's a weird hack. Mm -hmm. And for how that happens, I think the most important thing is with any dance school, whether it's mine or any dance school you join, like, especially for introverted people, but everyone, the most important thing is like you were talking about your job, which is there are so many different kinds of companies you can be part of, but you have to pick cultures where you feel like you don't have to fit in. And, and because I didn't grow up dancing, I started at 23, like I had body complex issues. I had a medical condition called hyperhidrosis. Like my palms would sweat so much. I remember I was 17. I'd walk with my girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, by walking and go like, wah, wah, wah. and she was like, are you nervous? I'm like, no, it's a medical condition. Here's my doctor's note, right? Like, and so at 22, like I went and got an operation. They went, cut me open between my rib cage to cut the connection to my hands. So my hands could never sweat. And two months later, I signed up for my first salsa level one class here because I just got sick and tired of, of not feeling like a man, trapped in my body, hating myself and frustrated. Nobody ever taught me to dance. And every time I was at a wedding or a club, I was always by the bar drinking and hating myself. 
And so when I started here, I, it wasn't because I wanted to run the school. I started here because I was looking for a place to belong. Originally, the shirt from the, was said family. When I took over six years ago, right, I, I brought in my own culture. But bringing full circle back, pick places like you were talking about. Pick places where you just being you at that given moment is enough. And so when my students come in and salsa level one or on, online, I help them feel like they're enough right now. We can always get better. But my problem was always, I will only get love if I go there yeah. versus I'm enough now. Oh my gosh. Listen, there's so many, so many gems of wisdom in what you said. Um, I feel embarrassed right now. <laughs> no, there's no I just went too many riffs there. No, I mean, what you said, um, if I can pick some of the gems that you dropped <laughs> in there, there's a beauty in being vulnerable. And being vulnerable is the only way to access a part of ourselves to actually connect with other people. It's the hardest thing to do to allow yourself to be vulnerable, especially like in a dance class. You don't know anyone. You're introverted. You're shy. And introverted, introvert isn't synonymous to shyness because, I, you know, there, there are degrees of introvertedness and shyness. And a lot of people have this misconception that they are synonymous. They are not. So if you're a person who's shy, introverted, you're in a new environment and you're dancing and you might not be good at it you are automatically putting yourself in a position to be vulnerable and for people to see you be vulnerable. So you're surrounded with a whole bunch of people who are putting themselves in a position to be vulnerable. So, you know, it, it's, it's a good feeling because, okay, we're all in the same boat. We'll all mess up together and, okay, we'll have fun. So that's good. So when we have to translate that into other spaces, We could actually do that, especially if we're talking about a work environment. We can be a bunch of newbies at a, at a job or not even. You could be the only newbie, but you're like, okay, this is a new job. This is a new experience. I might be a little nervous because this is my first week and I have a whole bunch of stuff to learn. But let me use that vulnerability to just showcase who I am and people will get to know me. And that's how I feel that somehow I can manage to feel like I belong. I don't have to fit in. Because I think that's really an obstacle that we place on ourselves. Um, that feeling of, I don't, I, I don't have what it takes to fit in with these people. And I think it's a great example that you, you offer a great space that you offer in your dance class to be able to go above that and to step out of our comfort zones. It's not easy, especially, yeah, with dance. But what would you say is some of the most memorable testimonies from the students in your class? You know, students who, who had to overcome that boundary, that, that shyness, or just the initial, like, maybe, like, the initial shock of stepping onto the floor and partnering with someone they never knew. What are some of the most memorable testimonies that you've received so far? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mention uh, a lot are coming, but uh, I'll mention one or two that are in person and one that happened actually recently on virtual that I was so proud of. So I, I have this kid who comes in, he's like 22. Um, and, um, you know, he's got so much love to give, but I, could, I also saw that he hasn't stepped into his own level of belonging. And so I'm a strong believer that when people are prickly, it's because they're vulnerable there. You know, like when you look at the most prickly flower, it's because it's trying to protect itself. And all those little needles are there like a hedgehog, right? Like the gooey Nutella center, right? It's the needle. It's okay. And so um, I started to see him start to come out and whatever. And at the beginning, because we do the story sharing, right? So like we do partner work online, but one of the breakouts during the classes Or one-on-one, -on -one, like I'll ask, what are you grateful for? And you get to talk with one person. So uh, he'd be paired up with, with, with different girls and stuff. And uh, we were on a phone call two weeks ago. And he said to me, he said, Alex, you teach two classes. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. He's like, you teach a salsa class. And you teach a positivity wellness class. He's like, what? He's like, 
as I've started taking your class, my relationships in my work, the people I'm spending time with and how I'm showing up has completely shifted. And again, I'm like, what? Because I, um, look, the reason I have the tattoo is because I, I question myself all the time. So I said, what? He says, yeah. He says, it's been two months. And the reason I come is because of the, I get two. And so I'm, I cr I'm crying on the phone because I'm seen. Like, this is belong. This is, this is open arms. This is understanding. And this is validation on such a deep level, the thing I struggled with. And um, it was just so beautiful th that he's feeling and living and seeing and taking that one hour, two hours, three hours that, that, that he's with me. And it's impacting every part of his life. And then he comes in and thanks me. And I give it not because of the, because I'm making money, but I give it because it's the right thing to do. And he's 23. Like who talks like that? I didn't talk like that at that age. Are you kidding me? And so of course my next question is like, so if it's two lessons, can I charge you double? He's like, oh, I didn't say that part. I didn't say that part, but that was the, that was the, um, that was the virtual and the in-person I've had a bunch of beautiful moments. One that I recall deeply about the impact was um, I had this uh, couple that would come to my class and a, a, like a super tall guy, um, a late sixties, but usually our student group is like, you know, late twenties to late thirties, sort of like you're out in the workforce, you're, you're building your career and you're having trouble making friends. You're having trouble connecting, right? Like, so people at that age, you know, like I took for granted, even though high school was hard, how easy it is to make friends. Not easy, but like how available that mm -hmm. is. How available that is, right? But like, we don't know each other. We're in high school. Come on, like it's a mess. But this couple came in and he's, you know, awkwardly moving and, 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 and just struggling and whatever. And every class I'd lift them up, lift them up. And uh, two beautiful things happen. One, so he finishes level one. And he comes up to me and I'm like, guys, level two is coming up. If you feel ready, go, because we don't do tests. Like, so there's no, like, you have to pass level one to go to level two. I always say, if you feel good, continue. If you want to work on it, work on it. Cause I want you to dance for the next 60, 70 years. So who cares if you repeat a level? Like the goal is to have dance and fun in your life, not nail moves. So just the right. So, so he comes in and at the end of level one, he says to me, he says, um, Alex, uh, I want to tell you something, but I'm really embarrassed. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I'm not ready for level two. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I hug him. I'm like, I was like, I, I don't know. I was like, maybe he needed money. Like in my mind, I was like, oh. so I was like, I don't know what, oh, did I mess? That I, was I rude? I don't know what, you know, like oh, worst can, uh, case scenarios. I'm like, okay, how can I support you? He's like, oh. the other couple, my friends, they're continuing to level two and I feel embarrassed. I was like, okay, uh, I love you. Do you want to continue dancing? He's like, oh my gosh, when I'm here with my wife, uh, it's just, just the world stops, it turns off, but I feel like, like a troll when I move. I still feel awkward. I'm like, okay, but you feel great when you leave the class? Yeah, I love it. I love it. It, it just, it, it charges me for the whole week. So I said to him, I'm like, why don't we just focus on that? And we can do private lessons, honestly, like, you could just meet me at one of the socials. We spend 15 minutes in the corner. I'm just going to work with you, support you. If, if what you get out of it is great and you just need to put a little more work, but you want to stay in it, I'll support you how you need me. He says, I'll think about it. So he steps back and I remember the other couple, their friends, level two is coming. I see them attended, so I'm seeing them. And then I see the, the husband and wife, the other couple. They're coming, but they're not in attendance. I was like, oh, maybe they forgot to register, but he's coming for level two. He comes with his wife holding his wife. And he and I say, Oh my gosh, you're not in the attendance, but we have room for you. Come join, you can pay later. Don't worry about it. Right. Like those things don't really care about. I'm like, I want you in the class. He's like, Alex, I'm not coming here to take level two. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, again, what's I'm like this guy with the edge? I'm like, <laughs> worst case scenarios, right? I'm like, you know, my glutamus maximus is clenched, you know, my my booty, right? I'm just like, this is I'm like, okay, what's going on? 
He's like, I was going to bring you cash. And he takes out his pocket cash. I was like, I was going to bring you cash to get to level two. But what you told me was, was, was what I needed to hear. He's like, after this level two, there's a level one. Here's the money. I'll see you in level one. For the next hour, my wife and I are going to go grab dinner. And so he goes, grabs dinner and goes to level one. And he continued dancing and continued dancing. But there was this thing that I keep seeing with my students of, it's not about the moves. It's about the feeling. Like dancing is a tool. 99% of people don't want to be so you think you can dance, stars, whatever. Mm. We all want to get to a place where we can show up anywhere in life with confidence, with energy, with openness. And dance does that. And at the same time, for me, I repeated level one multiple times. True story. When I wanted to be a volunteer after three years of dancing, three years, they said, no, I was a horrible dancer. When I wanted to be an assistant, they said, no, I was a horrible dancer. And I don't blink when I dance. In my defense, every time I dance with the school owner, I'd be so nervous I wouldn't blink. All right, that's in my defense. When I want to be a teacher, they said, no, there's no room. You might not be a teacher for two years. And you're not a good dancer. I said, I don't care. And so every step of the way, I was always the underdog. I was always the worst dancer. But the consistent thing was the people I met, the positivity, the energy, and the culture was show up on the dance floor as you are. We'll take care of the rest. And that, I think, is really what family is. I don't know if you can see right there, but that's what family is. The ideal family, the family you choose is the people that say, you're enough right now. Come sit at our table. So what? You drop some food. So what? You make up. It doesn't matter. We love you. And those are the, just two of the moments that I remember where um, I saw students step in to themselves and actually take that and live their life greatly outside of the school. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful um, what you were able to share with us. I know you have like probably thousands and thousands of others <laughs> really touching stories and testimonies. Um, what I can take away from what you shared with us, um, especially with the young man, 23 year old, is that it? 22, 22 23, yeah. 22. So my age when I started, yeah. I mean, to see how what he takes from the class translates into other areas of his life, you know, there's a, there's a, a really precious thing when you receive an overflow of something and then it overflows onto other things, you know, you can't really give what you don't have, you know? So it's hard to kind of operate in your different relationships, friendships, when there's something lacking. And what I mean lacking is there could be low self-esteem, there could be a lot of self-doubt. But when you kind of cultivate this self-love, because your, your classes provide a way for self-love, you know? I don't know if you noticed, but in what you say, that's what I can take from, is that your classes provide a space to cultivate that self-love and to really like dig in in a way that you don't, it's kind of subliminal because you're just dancing. <laughs> It's a little, you're like, oh, I like dancing. This is fun. Everybody's happy around me. This is great. Then the next day you're like, oh, I feel so energized from my class yesterday. It's really subliminal. So your students are able to kind of cultivate that self-love. And yeah. when you cultivate something, it's like a garden. You help it grow and you, 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 um, you make sure that you, you water your plants and there's enough sunshine and all of that. And then it grows. And then because from that beauty, you can use that beauty and spread it all around, right? So yeah. in a way, you are, I guess, the instigator of that self-love. You know, you're, you're an agent of change in people's wow. lives. And like I said earlier, your energy is very contagious. Therefore, whatever you are able to pour, you're able to pour into people's lives. And the way you pour into that, it you pour into uh, until it overflows. So these people are like, wow, I have so much love inside of me. I got to give some away. So for sure, it affects how that young man operates in his relationships and with his friends and all of that. And I think that's what we should all look for. 
you know, spaces that will allow us to cultivate that self-love, to really have a hunger to cultivate that self-love, you know, and we're not all fortunate to be in spaces or circles that are not toxic. You know, unfortunately it happens. It could be family dynamics that are toxic, friendships, work environments, all of that, you know, the, the kind of rhythm that we adopt in our lives can be like, you know, the rat race that can be toxic. So if we're only surrounded with that, it's kind of difficult to really take some time to pause, be still like regroup, regenerate and just be, um, in an environment that allow us to be like, okay, you know what? I am enough. What I have is enough. You know, my skills, I may not be an expert. I may not be an expert in dancing or professional, but you know what? I can move my left arm at the same time as my leg. That'll be yeah. good for the day. That'll be enough for today. And then tomorrow I'll move my other arm and my other leg at the same time. And then I, I'll sway my hips <laughs> and that'll be okay. <laughs> you know? But we have to we have to be in those types of spaces to allow us to be kinder to ourselves as well. Because from what I understand from both of the stories that you told us, is there it, it's got to be we've got to be in a place where we realize that our efforts are enough for the moment that we're in, and we should celebrate what we're able to do as well. You know, um, that man that you were talking about. You know, he's. He, he's clearly not an expert in dancing. He realizes that. But what he feels after the class, that's something he doesn't want to miss out on. So that's the sort of energy that we should keep in everything that we do and all kinds of circumstances. You know, the knowing that what we do right now in the moment is enough. And if at some point I get better, I'll get better. But right now, what I'm doing, this, this is pretty good. You know, we should celebrate those. I guess it's a small win, you know, being able to be grateful for where we're at right now. Um, I'd like to ask you now, how were you able to transition during the pandemic? I know it must have been really challenging knowing that your classes have become a go-to spot for your students. I'm sure your students... like. Every week they look forward to coming into the, to, to the class and seeing all the other students and just being in this amazing environment. Um, what was it like for you to have to transition during the pandemic to a virtual class? Yeah. Um, first, I want to say you just do such a beautiful job of summarizing what I've said with such clarity. Uh, I may be going to you next time I update the website for you. Just be like, here's what I'll say for half an hour. Can you just splash a couple of lines? So just, I, I'm just in awe of how you capture the essence and and deliver it in a in a succinct way. So thank you for that. I'm 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 learning from you in this moment. Um, yeah. So so when COVID hit in February, I can never say that month properly, and uh, February, whatever, <laughs> when COVID hit, um, it, just like for everybody, it was like, ah, hey, you, you know, the news, oh, everybody's always blowing things out of proportion, it's fine, and then the students started to drop out, and then in Canada, like, Ontario, our province, which, it, it, you know, is like a state in in. United States, right? So in the United States, you have states. In Canada, we have provinces. I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in Canada. Oh, my God. You are. You are. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in Montreal. Oh, my gosh. That's right. Okay. This is amazing. Why am I excited? Well, listen, this is for all the international Absolutely. people. Absolutely. It's a teaching pew, movement. Pew, 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 pew. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, but anyway, so when, when all of it hit, uh, and you can actually go on YouTube, like go Toronto Dance Salsa, and you go to March, like 13th or 15th, there's a video of me crying. So, 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 because I had to go and announce, we have to close our doors. And there's only been a few times in my life I've felt powerless. My mom had cancer, I felt powerless. Um, when I didn't get into university, because I didn't work hard enough and I spent a year and I finally got in. When, um, when I was training to be an instructor and a month into it, they said no. And from that, something flipped where I ended up taking over the school. 
There's been a few. And this was one of those moments where I was like, the government says I got to shut down. And the painful part was, this is a place where people can go on adventure, but also escape. Like, like they can turn off their responsibilities that, 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 they, that they might be in a toxic workplace. They might be in a toxic relationship. It might be a couple that fights all the time, except this one time when they walk to the studio. And I have to say no. And that crushed me. Because I didn't know what to do. I'm like, I don't know how to help. I don't know how to help right now. And uh, I, uh, I remember there was like this moment of like a spiral. There's a spiral because I'm like, especially within the auto industry, it's salsa, people touch. This is not a hip hop class. Even that's a, that's a tough, but this is like our whole business is based on people touching, strangers touching. 80% of our students are single people that come on their own and we guarantee them partners. Virtually, I guarantee partners, but that's way easier. But here it's insane, right? The amount of work. And now we're like, that's it. You can't, you got to go deal with it. And so it was also painful. I'll be honest with you because they labeled it in the wrong way because they called it social distancing instead of mm. physical distancing. You just set up humanity to say, we should not be in contact, not physical contact in contact. And so of course, depression and everything's, and I saw all these things coming and I'm crying and feeling powerless because I know what's coming. I know the blanket. And so all this happened and it was about two, three weeks. And, and uh, the, the thing that about two, three weeks into it, I was like, okay, I'm on this train. You know, I always believe like you buy a ticket on a train and that's a train of thought. So you buy a ticket for COVID. COVID is why I'm shut down. Government is why I'm shut down. I'm shut down. I'm shut down. I can't open. I can't open my, right? Like there's this, all these stops. The end result will always be the same. The final stop is always, I can't do anything about it. So I kept getting on this train in different way, but this, but this, and then someone really wise told me, he said, Alex, you can focus on the 997 reasons why you can't work or the three ways you can try. It's like both are truth. What do you want to do? So, so I went in and I thought about it a day or two. And then, and I said, okay, what is my school? It's always been a place of fun. There's always been this mental wellness, growth, positivity. And there was always people meet each other. And so that from that obsession, I started experimenting in quiet for like a month or two, figuring out testing different systems, inviting friends. And I built this thing. But what I built it on was connection, fun, and positivity. I never wanted any of my classes to be a transaction. And I think that was one of the more painful parts. It wasn't, for me, the frustration was, if it's virtual, you have to feel like when you're there, it matters. Like you have to feel like you're seen. You have to feel like you've exchanged energy with a person, not just received, because then that's a transaction. And I think we do that in relationships, right? Like this idea, right? Like that I will give you something and you give me back something. And I think that's cold. And so I built the virtual dance classes around what the culture has always been. And it was hard. Oh my gosh, so many mistakes, <laughs> but it's beautiful, right? Like it was like two, three months. And then I just thought, I'm like, okay, now we're, now we're ready. But that out of control is real. The thing as I'm going through COVID and listen, the reality is the world will always, will be different. Moving forward, the world is different. My fear, and I believe that fear can be a good motivator to run, but you just got to run in the right direction. Mm -hmm. My fear was when COVID ends, I will be worse off than when I went in. Like, I don't want that. Like, I don't want. And so I like, I lost a ton of weight during COVID. I gained some back and then I lost it again. And, and I did a lot of beautiful things during the shutdown period with the mentality of, I need to come out stronger. I can't just survive. I have to thrive. And that's been my model and continues to be the theme through my classes that we can, we can thrive, but we do need positivity. We need people who are giving us light, pouring into our cup because if, you know, proximity is power. Like if you're spending time, like as I'm spending time with you and I'm seeing you verbalize and be so eloquent about my thoughts, which you're going to be doing in a second as I'm keep talking, <laughs> 
I know you're jotting notes. I know you guys important <laughs> words. I see you, you queen. But this is important that 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 I see you, that you see me, and that gives us both hope. Mm-hmm. And when we went in, when they said social distancing, people took that literally. And it doesn't matter if you're introverted or extroverted. It's soul crushing. It doesn't matter if you need one or two friends or 30 friends. What we all need is meaningful connection. And that was always the thing in the studio. And so I'm like, it has to be built in to the way that we do it virtually. And it's so crazy. Like as we're talking, I'm still horrible at explaining that it's possible virtually because most people's idea is, well, I'm always on Zoom and I'm always doing it. I'm so tired where the gap, I get it. The gap is, and you've done it. The gap is, is just, you've had bad examples of how it's done, but that's like everywhere in life. That's like, I've had bad examples when I was younger of what love looks like. I've had bad examples of a healthy relationship until you run into the right community, the right family, the right friends that show you this. And you're like, that's possible. And you're like, yeah, keep coming with us. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And for having experienced one of your classes, I can definitely, it's at first I was, I was wondering like, how is this class going to be? I mean, this is virtual. So we'll all be like on our screens in front of our computers. There's going to be music in the background. Like, okay. But you really do feel like it is different. It is different. You know, you have to experience it. Um, I know that by looking through your Instagram, I was looking at a few posts and there's one quote that really stuck out, like stood out to me and it's where energy flows, attention goes. And that really relates to how you were kind of processing the transition that you would have to make with your business. You know, Um, your choice was to either look at the situation and throw a pity party and just say, okay, well, that's it it's over or really focus on your mission to create a social space and to keep and maintain it and finding ways for you to do that virtually for your students. So you were able to really um, channel that energy to save your business and not just save your business, but save the tool that you've created so people can belong. And I think that goes beyond just being a thoughtful leader, a thoughtful boss, but also um, being, like I said, an instigator of the peace and this agent of change. You didn't want your people to lose their community because essentially that's what was going to happen if you did not act, right? I mean, they were going to lose their community and a community, they, they worked hard to, they worked hard to, to stay there because we don't know what people are going through, right? You, you were saying that for some people, your dance class is escape, escape from work, escape from um, family life. You know, maybe someone has five kids running around all the time and they're, they're like, oh, today is my dance class. Oh, thank God. You know, that's their space. So you were able to preserve that because you pushed through. And I think a lot of your students will commend you for doing that, for not giving up on them because they, they need you, (laughs) you know, you're their captain, (laughs) they need their captain. (laughs) Um, What can you say are some of the upsides of doing classes virtually? Yeah. uh, uh, Two things come to my mind and they were both conversations with virtual students. So one of them was, um, so I, I called this girl because uh, she missed the, the Monday class, the free drop-in class. So she missed it. And I called her. I said, hey, how are you? My rule of thumb is if anybody misses a class or attends a class, I always call and check in on them. Also it helps me kind of make the experience better. So I'm always kind of learning and tweaking. So I called her and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't make it. I'm like, I love you. That's okay. We have more classes coming up. And then she was silent. I'm like, oh, something is off. So I said, what's going on? She's like, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I didn't show up intentionally. I was like, okay, tell me more. And she said, I was worried showing up on camera. Yeah. She said, I was worried and stressed about being judged and all these things and blah, blah, blah. And um, funny enough, the same thing that my students say. So I don't know if you can see, like there's glass here. Mm-hmm. That's a mall on the other side. And so oh people my. sometimes, co- yeah, yeah. So like, people <laughs> will come in 
students, I'd be like, oh, I'm worried people will watch and stuff, right? The gaze. And you actually talked about this in your poem, the power of the gaze, mm-hmm. right? Like what, you know, when someone looks at you, if you're not grounded, if you're in a vulnerable space, you're worried, you're scared. And that's mostly when you start to fit in. So I'm talking to her and I said, hey, it's, it's legit that like a lot of people worry about that. And I said, honestly, like the main camera's on me. The only time you ever do, like you see other people is when it's like this, you and I, like one-on-one and there it's no music, no pressure. You actually get to support each other. I said, but I don't want to put the pressure on you. And then she says, she interests me. She's like, you know what? I was like, what? She's like, actually it's easier. And I'm like, of course it is. But I'm like, where is she connecting it? I'm like, I know, but like, where is she connected? She's like, if I'm at my home, I can always just turn off the screen. I'm in control. Like, I can just be at home and be, and so I never even thought of the way she delivered that, but it totally actually makes sense. Like being at home is you're in your powerhouse, you're in your safe space. So in fact, in that way, it's actually easier to do it versus coming out to a dance studio, right? Like, and, and all of that. We, so that was the one point that I was, I was just like, oh, you queen, you just gave me an amazing thing that I get to now share with others, which is the truth. And that is like, when you're at home, you just, it's, you do it anywhere. And we have people do it in their forest, in their bathroom, in the right. hallway, in a stairwell. Like, this is amazing. And the second thing about the virtual that's good is the point that I just made. I had a student join me on her cell phone from Hawaii on a beach. And she didn't want to miss it. She was on vacation. First of all, I don't know how she got out on vacation with COVID times, but she did it. <laughs> anyway, but she was on her phone dancing. And there are people walking, volleyball, and she's dancing. And like, I'm not painting a picture of the most extroverted person because if you meet her, she's super introverted. But it, it's this ability that because your phone, your tablet now, it can connect you if you're connecting to the right community anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. So not only are you able to connect when you're at home, when you feel safe, but you can also do it from anywhere. And it's not a YouTube video, it's live. So when you show up, you matter. And you've seen this, right? I call up people's name. I'm like, what? Joanne, are you kidding me? Did you see her styling? Right? Because everybody sees me, but I see everybody splash on screen. So I'm always watching people moving and validating them. But those are the two things I would say for the virtual why it works. It's not supposed to be replacement for physical dance. That's not the conversation. The conversation is when things open up. How do you want to arrive in your life? How do you want to arrive into your workplace? How do you want to arrive in social interaction? So many people are tense as they're seeing COVID ending, but they're like, I'm not ready. The readiness, that's what that dancing will do. Because as you get to have fun and you get to step into your confident self, you get to be in a positive environment. When things do open up, you just feel more grounded and stronger. Waiting longer just makes it harder. It's like procrastination, ADHD, chronic procrastinator. It never helped when I was doing that paper, three in the morning, six Red Bulls in, right? It just gives more anxiety. And so how does everybody want to show up as everything opens? I think that's the more important thing. Yeah, and this is really an invitation to let go of anything that makes us self-conscious. If I can make... um, um, I guess a parallel with one of my poems, the poem tired of selling myself short, um, towards the end, um, I wrote other people's opinions don't affect me anymore. And that's where, what we're hoping for as we're entering into this post COVID area era, you know, a new burgeoning ego blossoms within me, an ego that won't be neglected to benefit others. My creativity is boundless and is reflected in my craft. That's how the love that we have when we're attending your class, this freedom, freedom, this freedom that we feel, we can use that in other areas of our lives to allow us to be free, to be ourselves. Um, also um, in that poem, um, I write, one cannot succeed without knowing the full extent of one's talents. I have no yeah. choice but to leap out of my comfort zone and discard any old fears of shadowing another spotlight. I cannot control the extent of my potential. The inner flame that ignites my passion will always expand regardless of past naysayers. I will not sell myself short. Sure. And I think 
your classes are a vehicle for that. And I want to applaud you for all the work that you're doing through your class and through your students. It's above just a job. You're more than a boss. You are a vehicle. You are an agent of change. You're an instigator of, of joy, of self-love, and of peace. And I want to thank you for being part of this episode. Um, would you like to tell us where we can find you online and how people can sign up to your classes? Yes. All you need to do is find me on Instagram, Toronto Dance Salsa, all one word. That's my account. And if you message me, and I check all the requests, if you message me, hashtag belong, I'm going to send you an invite to the weekly Monday free dance class, 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I, I'm always a strong believer, sometimes the hardest day is Monday. So the end of the night, I want to just celebrate tough potential day, but also charge you up for the rest of the week. And uh, Instagram is the best way. Just DM me, hashtag belong. Um, I'm so grateful you, you allowed me onto your stage. And I think it's season two, episode one. It is now. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> so I, I went loud. You may have to modulate the voices and audio. I am so grateful that when um, that we had a tender talk even before that, and you just showed up as you are, and I got to see you in in like your your flame. Also, like as we talked and progressed, like the boldness and the clarity, and you picking out the just the gems and sprinkling it back is just it was it's such an incredible honor and pleasure to have received your gift which is um, creating a space where I felt like I belong. And I really meant a lot. Well, I mean, I don't know what to say. This is, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for your energy. Um, thank you for being so candid. I know a lot of people will relate to everything that you said. And you will inspire many people to step out of their comfort zones and not, not be afraid to try new things and to just be themselves and allow themselves to belong wherever they go. So thank you so much. And to our listeners and to our viewers, uh, you can check out the other episodes of the Alpha Female Chronicles podcast on YouTube on my channel. You can also stream the episodes on different platforms such as Spotify, Apple, or Google, or your platform of choice, you can purchase the Alpha Females Chronicles Poetry Collection on the Prison Press website. So thank you guys, and uh, I'll see you next time.